Kia ora everyone and welcome to our Good Fellow webinar on endometriosis. My name is Dr. Courtney White and tonight we will hear from a panel of experts, uh, Dr. Michael East, Director and Consultant Obstetrician and Gynecologist at Oxford Women's Health with a special interest in endometriosis. Dr. Orna McGinn, an Auckland GP, Clinical Director of Primary Care Women's Health at ADHB. Hannah Orr, an Auckland-based pelvic health physiotherapist working in public and private. Dr. Sarah Corbett, gynecologist with special interest in complex laparoscopy for endometriosis. Our four experts will speak for about 10 minutes each, and then we'll be joined for the question and answer session later by Deborah Bush, co-founder of Endometriosis New Zealand and principal of the World Endometriosis Organization. I will now hand over to our panel. Thank you. So I'm just going to set the scene, if you like, um, in terms of the scale of the problem of endometriosis um, and as to why the guidelines were uh, put together for New Zealand specifically. So if you just bear with me with a little bit of loose mathematics for a moment and assume that 10% of women within the reproductive age band um, have endometriosis and they presented for surgery, then given that age group, it would amount to about 3% of the population um, and say 150,000 women. So 50 gynae surgeons were available with the required skill set uh, to do the surgery, they'd have 3,000 patients each and there are only 303 consultant ONGs in New Zealand. So if they were all... Um, if you look at sort of 65 patients a week, then that's 13 a day, five days a week for 46 weeks. That just cannot be achieved. And even if all ONGs were able to operate on such patients, then they'd have around 13 patients a week each. And bear in mind, most publicly employed gynees have four hours of operating time available to them per week at the most. And some they don't even have an operating list every week. So in short, it's bigger than Ben-Hur. The national problem is insurmountable by surgery alone. So because of that scale, uh, and because it is a major health and well-being problem for women in New Zealand, and the, the, there is a lack of uniform and equitable approach to management, that led to the production of the New Zealand guidelines as a consensus document um, to promote early diagnosis, early management in primary care, trained multidisciplinary secondary and tertiary care, and equity of access and health outcomes. And um, I'll leave it at that and I'll, I'll be coming back to you later. Here we are. So um, I, I thought since we were talking about um, sort of equitable access to care and this patient journey starting in primary care and what we can do as first line in the community in someone that we may uh, suspect has endometriosis. I thought uh, the easiest thing to do is actually just to illustrate with a patient's story. Um, and this, this is one of my patients who's given permission for her story uh, to be shared. And um, clearly it was the system that failed this patient, not any individual. So, you know, that that hopefully will raise a few questions about maybe what is possible to, uh, to change or improve. So essentially last October, um, I uh, saw this patient as a new patient to me, although she, she was had been registered at our practice for quite some time. So she was 24, she was studying to be a midwife and also working part-time to fund her studies. And she had a long history, really since she was about 16, of very painful periods which had resulted in her missing school. Um, and she gave a, a really striking history of uh, everything that would lead you to believe that she had quite um, severe endometriosis. She had uh, obviously very painful periods. She was vomiting during her period. She had bowel symptoms. She had uh, dyspareunia. Um, she was tearful. She really didn't look well. And she said that she was feeling desperate. She had been on and off the pill for years. Nothing had really helped. So she wasn't taking it at the time that I saw her. And she had been referred to gynecology by one of my colleagues um, earlier uh, last year, and the referral had been rejected at that time as there was no capacity. 
So during, during um, you know, we, we only get 15 minute appointments, so, as you know, um, but so, but I spoke to her for a good long time because I, I, I could see that, you know, she'd obviously been through the mill. Um, she rated her quality of life as three out of 10. Um, so really that, that, uh, that day, it was just about acknowledging that she was in uh, a lot of distress, sort of discussing the uh, discussing central sensitization and, and all about that, gave us some information from endometriosis NZ. Um, and, and I said, look, at, at this stage, I think probably some pelvic physiotherapy to try and unwind uh, you know this this situation that, that you're in where really your whole your whole body is is you know is tense would be really helpful in the short term and we will refer you back to gynecology and in the meantime um, seeing as she hadn't really got on with the combined pill we talked about starting Sarah's at um, and I explained that that was unfunded and the, the cost of that varies but a three-month supply is sort of between 40 and 70 dollars but you know she was keen to to try something different so, um, the, and the reason I just put this up there just to say that in, in a lot of our patients who've got dysmenorrhea, it wouldn't have been suitable for, for this patient because she was, in, you know, she, was, she had such pelvic floor spasms, there's no way I would have been able to consider doing a, a, a Myrena at this stage. But even if I had been thinking about it, this is the decision tree that I have to go through um, to see whether I have funding for my patients for Myrena. And unfortunately, dysmenorrhea is not, um, a funding criteria um, that I, I won't expect you to, to go through that. You're welcome to take a picture of it and, and sort of trawl through it at your leisure. We've got four different funding streams and um, it is very hard to get funding for, for Myrena. So as I say, referred her off to physiotherapy and she was accepted, but the issue was she was going to be waiting for 10 plus months. And actually uh, that's kind of an underestimate because I think the waiting list is now blown out in counties to about 18 months. So I talked to her about seeing a physiotherapy th physiotherapist privately, which actually is Hannah, who's here on the um, on the panel. And again, she said, y y please, yes, I just would like to see somebody to get something done. So, you know, she that we were able to at least start that. And I thought then, well, I'll just have a look back through her history and see where she has come from to get to, to this point. And because uh, I always find this interesting because we do know that women wait quite a long time before their endometriosis is uh, acknowledged uh, and, and treated. Um, so she actually had a very, uh, very typical history, actually. So going back to 2014, she'd been seen at family planning um, with painful periods and started on the pill. So she was, so she was around sort of 16, 17 at that time. Um, the following year, she'd come in um, saying that whenever she tried to stop it, painful periods of vomiting returned. So she was restarted on the pill. And it was already noted that she had some anxiety and depression related to this pain. Saying the following year, she still had these painful periods of vomiting. So it was recommended that she then try cycle um, the AVA that she was on. 2017, uh, problems were still ongoing. She described herself as being paralyzed with pain. Usually on the first day of her period, she would vomit and faint. And this had now at this stage been going on for several years, but she felt that it was worsening and was beginning to ask, could she have endometriosis? So at that stage, her um, combined pill was changed to over 30 instead of 20. And then she came in again the following year. And at this stage, her the main issue she was complaining of that was that she had developed deep, deep dyspareunia. And this was an issue because she was going to be getting married the following year. It was creating some difficulties with her and her partner. And again, she was asking perhaps, could it be endometriosis? And it was suggested that maybe she tricycle the AVA 30. And it was explained to her that um, a guy, a local gynae probably wouldn't see her at this stage. And a review um, was arranged for three months, which actually she didn't, um, it doesn't look like she, she came back for. And it was interesting to note that um, the GP she saw felt that gynae wouldn't investigate. And that may be um, a reflection of some of the pressures that's on our gynecology service uh, in Auckland, it is very difficult to get patients seen um, with, with pelvic pain. So June 2019, seen again at this stage, she really was quite depressed. She was on the vaccine by now. And it's a bit chicken and egg because we know that, you know, if you've got chronic pain, you're far more likely to develop depression and anxiety. 
Um, so, but then it was also depression and anxiety can make pain feel, feel worse. But, you know, she really did have a, a, a good reason to be, to be struggling. So things began to get worse. And this is still leading up to the time when I saw her in October last year. So now she was beginning to go to ED because the pain was so bad. So February, she went in twice. So the first time she went in and she was actually admitted um, for rehydration because she had been vomiting and she had a metabolic alkalosis because of the vomiting with her dysmenorrhea at the beginning of her periods. Um, ED, put a referral into OBS and Gynae, but um, it was rejected because it hadn't been accompanied with, by an ultrasound. So again, there are quite stringent criteria to have patients accepted. Uh, it's not just in our DHB, it's around, uh, it's around the country. I mean, because as I say, there are a lot of pressures on, on services. Uh, and you have to have an ultrasound to get referred in with pelvic pain. But then if the ultrasound comes back normal, it's usually another reason why the patient's not accepted. But we'll come to that. Anyway, so the GP then got the note that she'd been to ED twice, the second time with constipation from the codeine she had been discharged with at the previous ED admission. Uh, and the GP then organised the ultrasound which came back not showing anything um, of, of note. And the GP then referred to gynecology. So this is um, 2020, so sort of five years after she, she first presented to, to AGP. Um, so great news. Uh, the referral was accepted to Women's Health with a priority three to be seen within four months. So if you look at the date, that was 24th of March. And on the very same day, um, another, <laughs> another note came in. And this was that the referral had been graded by a clinician as needing to be seen, but declined by the organization due to capacity issues. So that's, that's an interesting concept um, that clinicians can grade, but somebody else within the organization then declines because there is not capacity. And then a few days later, we had a very polite um, letter to the practice referral now rejected because the number of referrals being a, are greater than the resources allow us to accept. So essentially what that means or seems to mean is that um, our local gynecology service is actually closed to all but P1 and P2. And um, you know, this, unfortunately this, this is the case. Uh, it, it is, Getting patients actually to be seen in the first place is very difficult. Um, so what happened after that? Well, she had another ED admission. And then it was after that that, that I saw her. And I, after reading through this history, I thought, well, the, how, you know, what would, the, what would it be that would enable this lady to get seen? Uh, so I spoke to a mole um, and uh, in the ONG department, how would this story, obviously this patient needs to be seen, but how can she get seen? And apologies if I am now uh, letting a state secret out of the bag, but uh, the advice was to actually refer to the chronic pain service rather than to, than to gynecology. And this approach worked because the referral was then accepted and uh, she was graded as P4 to be seen in the combined clinic within four months. So that was great. In the meantime, another ED admission. Um, this was very soon after she had seen me. We started Sarazat. Um, ED discussed with Gyni on call, who very helpfully said, <laughs> change back to the combined pill and refer to Gyni if ongoing pain. Um, so, you know, but the, the left hand and the right hand are not in communication. So that's, that's really how that happens. Anyway, the patient then got an appointment, combined pelvic pain clinic. It was a two hour appointment. It was thorough. It was multidisciplinary um, involving a gynecologist, pain specialist, psychologist, pelvic physiotherapist. Um, and the letter that came back um, was sobering. You know, it said that pain had really ruled her life. She had, had felt invalidated. She was started on some medication and booked for a laparoscopy. I saw her the following week where she then, or a couple of weeks later, where she described that appointment and the appointment that she'd had with the pelvic physio while she'd been waiting as awesome. Um, um, but she was still very distressed, in a lot of pain. She'd had to withdraw from her midwifery course because really she felt that she could not manage. 
um, on top of the part-time job and the amount of pain that she was in. The other issue, of course, was becoming um, one of the financial uh, implications of, of multiple GP visits. Uh, and in our DHB, we're quite lucky because we have funding for what we call a wellness program. So anyone who has um, mental uh, health, mental distress, anxiety, can be enrolled in a wellness program where all their GP visits are funded and we also have access to a, a health coach. Um, so I was able to enroll her on that so I could address the coexisting mental health needs that she had and then her visits would be funded. And this actually, you know, became quite important because over the next few months, really, she deteriorated. She was in a huge amount of pain, escalating amounts of analgesia, none of which were really helping. And, um, you know, it is it is quite difficult in primary care sometimes to manage chronic pain in your patients. It is, you, you can feel quite helpless. Um, and I, I mean, I was lucky I had access to very good advice from the pain clinic who was seeing uh, this patient. But, um, you know, I, I was concerned because I knew that the, the waiting time for surgery um, was quite long and potentially she could be on this list for a year or longer. Uh, so she had, you know, another ED attendance. She had several GP reviews. But I'm very glad to say that the week before last, she had surgery because some of the surgery is now being outsourced to the private sector, done by the public physicians, but done, the public surgeons, but done in the private sector um, where there is more capacity. So she actually was outsourced to one of those private hospitals to be done by one of the county surgeons. And there it confirmed that she had endometriosis on the left pelvic side wall, patch of Douglas, right pelvic side wall. So, you know, I guess that validated her feeling that she had endometriosis and she's recovering really well. Um, so let's just briefly say, look, what it, what is the issue here? So, I mean, the issue is that the system is not working. Um, there was a, a report that came out uh, the week before last from the Commonwealth Fund looking at um, 11 high income OECD countries. And they looked at parameters which would predict, uh, you know, efficiency of good care in a health system. And this is what they looked at on the left. Um, so New Zealand, you know, respectable six out of 11, but but the US is an out, a total outlier. So it's actually really out of 10. Um, but where we really didn't do well is cost and equity. So we're there only just, you know, in front of the US uh, with access being an issue to patients because of cost. And what they were looking at, if you look at the bottom, the definition of cost related access problems include skipping doctor's visits because you can't afford them, skipping tests, treatments, follow up or prescriptions. And again, we know this is an issue. Um, so, you know, what can we do? So. I think in, in primary care, we can try and we can try and upskill to do our best. Uh, you know, there's the we, there's lots of things that we can do at the beginning if women have come in with dysmenorrhea and pain, painful periods. And uh, I really like the RANSCOG e-learning module, which has been made freely available to all New Zealand uh, GPs. So you can just log in, create uh, create an ID, and it's it's a really thorough course and it also contains a, a a rating tool that you can go through with your patients to to look at the likelihood of, of, of endometriosis and the severity what else we need to make um the treatments that can alleviate some of the symptoms like serizet and mirena funded and yes mirena is funded but the insertion is not and um where one um associate professor of nursing who I spoke to today I know is watching was telling me that on the North Shore um, women can pay up to $350 for Mirena insertion and you know that is way out of reach of most women. What else can we do? We could have a national election plan. This is what um, Australia uh, introduced in 2018. They have a national action plan for endometriosis but to be quite honest what we really need is a women's health strategy. <laughs> we haven't got a women's health strategy and all of these things overlap because pelvic pain is not one thing in isolation. Um, you know, women have unmet needs at every step of the journey. But um, so I, I just wanted to highlight this because there is a, a, um, a piece of work going to the Health Select Committee on the back of this petition and um, people can share their stories or patient stories with permission 
And, you know, maybe we will end up with a, a women's health strategy. So um, that's, that's uh, really the primary care aspect. And I'm looking forward now to hearing from my, from my colleagues about what happens when our patients see them. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the role of physiotherapy in the management of women with endometriosis, albeit a very brief overview. So it's important to first acknowledge when um, physios, that physios are not just chasing muscles. It's about recognizing the complexity of pain and that it's a signal from the brain responding to the many possible actual or perceived threats. Um, so each woman's story needs to be heard in a biopsychosocial approach, appreciating all of the layers that contribute to or a response to her pain. Understanding a woman's pain is also about appreciating the peripheral mediators such as um, the myofascial system and the context of a potential centrally sensitized nervous system. Someone who goes from having cyclical to non-cyclical more persistent pain with maybe added, maybe added irritable bowel or bladder pain syndrome or increasing dyspareunia or vestibular dynia will have central sensitization. And this is really important for women to understand because I think we still grow up with the narrative that pain is a linear response to tissue damage and this can make understanding persistent pain so overwhelming and we know that the worst pain is unexplained pain. So providing um, education around pain science and the role of changes in the peripheral and central nervous system can allow a woman to understand the complexity of her pain and the role of seeming unrelated um, threats such as anxiety, poor sleep, stress, negative sexual experiences, adverse childhood events, often discussions around which are perceived as this is all in my head, but with good pain education, women can understand them as contributors to threats. And giving, we know that given negative thinking alone can increase pain and swelling in the peripheral tissue. Pain education does offer an intervention that's so simple yet empowering and can reduce pain. So my first take home message is if you do have a woman sitting in front of you and there is evidence of central sensitization, like, so she's had persistent pain for over three months, um, allodynia, hyperalgesia, increasing referred pain. Explaining pain can be a simple and effective intervention. Even if we can't remove the primary drivers such as endometrial tissue, it maybe will help control some of the contributors and potentially take an unbearable situation to something more manageable. And there's some really good resources, which I've added a link to at the end of this talk for clinicians and patients. Um, if you go onto the Norway website, um, to have a look at. But now moving on to the myofascial system. So when a physiotherapist is assessing a woman with pelvic pain, we normally start with the abdominal cylinder. And at the top of the abdominal cylinder, we've got the diaphragm. And so I'm going to play this clip. So when I um, explain the diaphragm to women, I describe it with three important functions. So if you, as you watch this video, you can see um, the diaphragm acts almost like a coffee plunger. And when it descends down, it creates intra-abdominal pressure which helps to lengthen out the abdominal wall and lengthen the pelvic floor muscles, which are often um, overworking in these women. You can also think of it as it descends down, it acts a bit like a gut massager, so it helps to aid digestion and improve um, gut motility, which also is often a big problem in these women. And thirdly, um, when you've got a well-working diaphragm and your upper chest muscles are nice and relaxed, it's a message to your brain that there's no tiger chasing you. So it helps to uh, down-regulate the nervous system, which is really important in acute pain management, but also really important when you have um, more persistent pain and you have an up, um, up-regulated central nervous system. So my second take home message is if you've got um, someone with persistent pain sitting in front of you and there's clear evidence that she's overusing her upper chest muscles and there's little movement in her uh, belly when she's breathing, is send her home with some mindful diaphragmatic breathing exercises and you can just Google diaphragmatic breathing and there's a plethora of videos on YouTube or you can, I've also added a link at the end of this um, presentation because there's so much bang for buck in terms of just learning to breathe well. And then moving down to the wall of the um, abdomen, abdominal cylinder. So um, when a physio is assessing these women, we'll be looking at um, skin, at connective tissue, at scars, and at the abdominal muscles as sources of pain. Um, often these muscles go into protective mode in response to recurrent dysmenorrhea. And if you think often the favorite position is the fetal position. And so it's not uncommon to have tight, sore, rectus abdominis, obliques, quadratus lumborum, psoas muscles. 
and then they can then become the drivers of pain if they're not treated. And in clinic, you can do a quick carnets test. So if you lie a woman down and you palpate her tummy for uh, any provoked pain or any reproduction of her pain, and just get her to tense up her tummy muscles and lift her head and shoulders up off the bed, if that increases her pain, it's very likely there's a myofascial component. And again, this will be um, helped out with physio or just sending her home, I mean, like letting her Google some abdominal stretches or doing some um, her own self-massage can help this um, pain. And last but not least, we have the pelvic floor muscles. So the pelvic floor muscles are first responders to threat. And this doesn't have to be um, a sexual nature in terms of threat. There was a study done in 2001 that assessed the electrical activity of the pelvic floor muscles while women watched um, a five minute video clips and one of them was jaws and the pelvic floor muscles were first responders. And so they'll go into protective mode in response to any source of threat, whether it be inflammatory pelvic pain related to endo, anxiety, chronic stress, and then they themselves can be become the driver of the pain. When we're assessing the pelvic floor muscles, so this here shows you the superficial pelvic floor. So of course, we're gonna have a look at the vulva and the um, vestibule for any skin issues or any increased uh, hyperalgesia or allodynia. But in terms of the muscles, we're looking at, um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor here, but the superficial urogenital triangle. So we have the transverse perineae, bulbospongiosis and ischiocabinosis. All of these muscles can become tight and overactive and um, they'll cause pain with attempted penetration of a finger, tampon, speculum, a penis, as well as contributing to maybe urethral or perineal pain. And it's important to appreciate that they can also be subconsciously engaged in anticipation of potential threat. So a woman might say consent to a vaginal exam or be willing to have um, penetrative intercourse, but her muscles might not be so willing. And so it's really important not to reinforce this response by unnecessary vaginal exams or persistent attempts at intercourse. And often um, we might tell women just to stop trying to have penetrative intercourse altogether and rather a graded exposure to muscle relaxation and muscle stretch in a really safe, non-threatening way um, is a really important approach for these women. And then going deeper, we're now looking down into the pelvis. And um, here you can see the levator ani attaching in behind the pubic bone into the pelvic side wall through the arcus tendineus levator ani, and then um, attaching in the back to the tailbone and the anocoxygeal raphae. The pelvic floor muscles form the biggest um, portal in the human body and are much more well um, recognized for their role in keeping our pelvic organs inside us and helping us control our bladder and bowels. Um, but they are much like your upper traps in the contribution to headaches. And that's the best way to explain it to women. It's like a headache in the pelvis. If they're tight and overworking, it will feel achy and sore in your pelvis. Um, and your obturator internus is another big muscle. So this attaches into the pubic sidewall. Here, it's a hip external rotator. It can become really overactive and tight and sore, and it will contribute to bladder pain symptoms, to urinary urgency, to um, dyspareunia. And it often refers to the ovaries, so it can often feel like ovarian pain. So um, in an ideal world, we would be assessing all of these muscles in women with pelvic pain to acknowledge whether they are, uh, they are the cause or the driver of their pain or they've responded and they're now becoming contributors to their pain. But this doesn't always happen. Um, and so I just wanted to lastly talk about um, inequities within our healthcare system. And I have a great colleague, Angela Upstell, who works here at Counties Monaco with me. And um, she recently did some work looking at um, the equity of access and outcome in our chronic pain services across ethnic groups in New Zealand. And what she found was underrepresentation of Pacifica um, and as, as well as uh, significantly more pain, greater psychosocial impairment and larger impact of pain on life for Māori and Pacifica as compared to European attending the chronic pain services across New Zealand. And she went on to complete a master's project to look at um, why they were underrepresented. And um, so her thesis was on exploring the beliefs in relation to pain in the Samoan community and how they seek help. And one of the key themes that emerged from her study was around stoicism. And she included a quote in her study, which when translated means, if a girl is born, it must be a pain of birth. If a boy is born, it must be a pain of tattoo. 
And there's a real similar stoicism applied to period pain and a normalization around period pain. And given that we have so many women dismissed about their period pain, it's so important to acknowledge that these women aren't even likely to attend to come to the GP for help. And I work at Counties Monaco in South Auckland, seeing women with pelvic pain. And for an area with a high population of Pacifica and Māori, this is absolutely not reflected in my caseload. Add to the normalization and stoicism around period pain, there's also the cultural difference around the ease with which anything pelvis can be discussed, adding um, such significant barriers to accessing care. So I think it's also really important we look at our model of care. And it, it's not, uh, it's about fostering relationships with the communities um, and school nurses, aunties, mothers to discuss what is normal, what's not normal, empowering these women to be able to access help rather than waiting for them to come to us for help. And then of course, um, as Orna said, it's about having a service when you refer. And I know here at Counties Monaco, we do have quite a big waiting list that won't be helped with the current lockdown, but um, lots of DHBs are looking at how they can provide a service and maybe being a bit more creative. So looking at online and group talks, which um, we are also looking at here and hopefully that will allow a more timely access to service. And thank you. I'll now pass on to Sarah Corbett. Hi there, kia ora. Um, ko tahaea te maunga, ko te awahau to awa, to tarimano te marae, ko Ngāti Rangawewi he te iwi, ko te arawa te waka, ko Corbett te uh, ingoa matua and ko Sarah Toko ingoa. Um, so I guess I'd just like to first of all start by um, welcoming everyone. Um, I grew up in Auckland. Uh, I'm from Rotorua, my family originally, and I went to school at Auckland Girls Grammar School, which is an extreme, extremely diverse inner city girls school. My mother was a teacher in South Auckland. My father was an engineer turned theologian who ran the Baptist City Mission for many years. So for me, social justice runs deep in my blood. Um, I worked in Rotorua Hospital in my early years as a doctor, and then since then I've basically been based at Middlemore Hospital with some excursions to other places for training. Um, and then I, I also did my advanced laparoscopic um, surgical training at Middlemore Hospital as well. I never wanted to do private practice. It was always uh, the last on my list, but um, after a year as a consultant at Middlemore, getting one operating list a month, I felt I needed to maintain my skills. Um, and so I joined Ascot Women's Clinic, which is where I practice now in private. For me, the best thing about private practice has been getting to know my patients, which I just don't get to do much in public practice. And I have a therapeutic relationship with them. And it means that together we can try different strategies. And also it's meant that I've got to learn so much from my patients. Um, the worst thing about private practice is being confronted with the huge gap in what I'm able to offer in public versus private. Um, I had a physiological reaction to Orna's story. <laughs> and I feel this represents a lot of patients that I um, that I see at Middlemore and um, the burnout rates are high because of this, I think amongst our department. Um, so this is kind of the bad news. Um, the current system in private, in my opinion, is not working well for our patients. Um, it's characterized, you know, my patients have got, um, I work with the woman with most severe endometriosis um, involving their bowel. And often by the time we, see them and um, acknowledge what the problem is and then make a surgical plan. By the time we get to operate on them, many of them have lost their jobs or are um, in desperate straits with no sick leave left. Um, many of them, their relationships are broken up. They're unable to have sex despite trying to have a baby. Um, many um, are now in chronic pain with central sensitization. We've got patients who develop opioid and benzo addictions. So this is, you know, um, got a significant impact on these women's lives um, from this delay in, in uh, management that we're able to achieve. Um, I know, you know, there's some great studies that I've alluded to at the bottom of my slide. Um, there's not many New Zealand studies about barriers to endometriosis care. Um, there's quite a lot of literature overseas that's been well studied. There's two studies which I've seen which kind of address the New Zealand experience. And a lot of that um, is to do with looking at abnormal uterine bleeding or gynae cancer, which is, a, and has a similar barriers to seeking help in primary care. 
So the major barriers are sort of the knowledge of what's normal and abnormal. I think there's really, um, I know Deborah Bush has done a study about this and hopefully we'll present her slide later, but particularly amongst my Pacifica patients, like I think the knowledge of what's normal in your period and what's acceptable or what needs to be uh, escalated to a healthcare professional is, um, is not there. Um, you know, we have so many patients who come to ED for the first time presenting with heavy bleeding with a hemoglobin in their 40s and haven't seen anyone before. So uh, when you ask a patient, is your period normal? They say yes. And then you say, um, how many pads do you use? They say, I don't use pads. I use my children's nappies. Um, so, you know, I think there's a real disconnect between what's normal and abnormal. Um, there's huge issues about stigma and shame going to see someone. Um, First of all, having to go to the doctor about it and talk about it. Um, people in your community might um, know what's going on. You know, they might think you have a problem. Um, if you, you know, people prefer to talk to a female doctor. Um, they don't necessarily want to talk to someone of their own culture, particularly if they're in a small community. Um, if they're having to go to somewhere like family planning has got additional shame, they might think that if someone sees them coming out of there, maybe they think they might be pregnant or have an STI. Um, there's a huge issue with cost and convenience. Um, you know, we know that GP funding is, um, is an issue for patients and also obviously hours of clinics. Um, and there's a, a big sort of uh, issue with as well, prioritizing others over themselves. You know, like um, I was going to come to my appointment and then my daughter got sick or I thought this, if I didn't go, then someone else more needy than me would get the appointment. Um, and then there was also the sort of barriers that are associated with what we do as healthcare providers. Um, many patients have had previous negative experiences and they've had their symptoms dismissed um, or minimized or have had interventions that haven't helped. Um, it's worse if you have, if you're seeing a healthcare provider with which you've got no previous relationship, like if you're at a GP practice where you don't necessarily get to see your regular GP. Um, that has, has quite an impact on your ability to bring up these issues. Um, and for me as well, I think that many women um, won't volunteer symptoms so readily. You, you have to really, as a doctor, pry for the symptoms, you know, like find the clues and then push for the, for the specific questions to really get the full history. Um, yeah. The, the other bad news is obviously limited secondary care um, capacity. So yeah, Orna alluded to this, at Counties Manukau, we haven't been seeing any P3 referrals other than women with abnormal uterine bleeding because they might have cancer um, for around two years. Um, so that's anyone with prolapse or incontinence or anyone with pelvic pain unless they have a assist on ultrasound scan. Um, I've, we've done, uh, I've just found out from around the country about other people's capacity. And I think most people are still seeing patients with pelvic pain, obviously with a lot of caveats around prioritization because of scan or um, ED referrals or things like that. Um, but I, I think Taranaki have just started declining new referrals. I say they've got 400 FSAs waiting. Um, so they're having to decline new referrals. Um, within our uh, secondary system as well, we have a huge problem with wait lists. I mean, currently at counties where I am, we've got 50 people waiting for surgery for stage four endometriosis, and that wait time's up to 18 months. Um, well, people are waiting uh, about 80% uh, on Zolidex, um, which is a, a basically renders them um, menopausal, but despite that, many still have ongoing pain or bleeding. Um, while people are waiting, there's been an average of, uh, on our wait list in the last year, 24 days of acute emissions, one of the patients four times, and we've had to do 17 additional clinic visits to try to manage pain while waiting um, for surgery. Um, even amongst <clears throat> the country as well, I mean, there's a huge difference between um, what people are able to access depending on where they are. Um, so, you know, I want to alluded to the access to Myrena. I mean, this hugely depends on your DHB as to what is funded. I mean, we're so fortunate now to have Myrena and Judith funded as the device, but the insertion costs, you know, even, you know, you cross the road to a different DHB and someone will 
get it funded in certain versus not. And that's a huge barrier to women. Access to ultrasound, even within Auckland, is a huge difference between what you can get depending on your DHB. Pelvic floor physio, I mean, we're, um, we're fortunate to have such great skilled physios like Hannah Orr, but you know, the, the wait time is significant. Um, many DHBs don't have a pelvic floor physio available as well. Um, access to an MDT pain team. I mean, we have um, seven out of 21 DHBs have got a pelvic pain clinic um, as an MDT run. Psychologist and counseling, um, you know, access to this is extremely difficult um, and also really dependent on where you, where you live and a patient's ability to pay. Access to a surgeon with the appropriate skills. I think about seven DHBs are currently referring advanced endometriosis to other DHBs, but that's also fraught with issues around funding between DHBs. It's not necessarily a straightforward process to be able to refer a patient to another hospital for surgery um, without a, a sort of unified response. Um, also, uh, fertility services is a massive issue as well. I mean, we can't talk about endo without talking about fertility and um, the criteria and I think the wait times do vary throughout the country. Um, there's also quite a lot of criteria which are quite difficult for our Pacific and Maldi patients, particularly around BMI. Um, when we have women who are otherwise ovulating regularly with a BMI of 35 who can't access fertility treatment, um, yet we have many women who come in spontaneously conceiving with BMIs of 50 or 60 regularly on delivery suite, it does make you think that it's obviously just not the research done in this particular population to back up that cutoff. Um, also, the, the bad news is about funding and medications. I mean, we've got uh, some, medic it's very limited in choice of what we can use in New Zealand in primary care to help manage uh, the uterus and endometriosis lesions in terms of hormones. CRZ has got a great cost. And especially when we start to need to double it, you know, that $45 every three months suddenly turns into $90 every three months. Our guidelines talk about Dynagest or Vazan, which, um, by all reports is very helpful for pelvic pain and has a lot less um, side effects, but um, uh, we just don't have it in New Zealand. And then of course the insertion of Mirena. Um, for me, the biggest thing that we can do is about early intervention and recognition. Um, we know about the significant patient factors, we know about the health care provider factors, Really important is the relationship we have with us and our patients of listening and validating symptoms. And um, this enables education and it also facilitates the trial and error that's needed um, to have successful management of endometriosis. Really encouragingly, there's multiple guidelines now um, in RANSCOG and our Ministry of Health guideline, which now state, we don't actually need surgery to have a presumptive diagnosis of endometriosis. In primary care or in secondary care, we can listen to people's symptoms and come to a working diagnosis of endometriosis and treat it without needing to um, worry about surgical uh, uh, management or surgical confirmation. Um, and we've got some great new educational resources, as Orna said. Um, just going to briefly touch on what I do when I'm in clinic. Um, so, you know, for me, I've got the hand because that's what I always remember with endometriosis. This guides my. Um, History and examination, this also guides my management. So for me, the main things that I do is manage the uterus or lesion with hormones, and I just give as much hormone as I need to to give amenorrhea, particularly adding on more progestogens and a lot of education for patients around the importance of that so they don't just feel you're fobbing them off with hormones. Um, managing the bowel. So most of my patients have got symptoms of irritable bowel disease. Um, Managing the bladder, painful bladder, history of recurrent UTIs, um, managing the pelvic floor, which can lead to pelvic floor spasm pain and, um, and superficial dyspareunia, and then central sensitization, and underpinned by a consideration of past trauma, because we know that women with chronic pain um, have got a much higher chance of having an adverse um, event in their childhood. Um, for me, the, the biggest thing is that this doesn't need to be done in secondary care. If we had a well-funded primary care system, then the only things we really need secondary care for is surgery, maybe a gastro to, rule, to do a, a colonoscopy, um, an MDT pain team, and fertility specialist. Um, and then we can save secondary care for triaging the surgical cases and judicious use of quality surgery to treat peritoneal disease, and then tertiary care for the difficult cases. So my key messages are really, um, first of all, listen and validate to patients' uh, experience. That's 
that kind of back and forth really goes a long way with patients and that's often the relief that they need. Uh, specific questions, so if a Pacific Island woman comes to you with period pain, I think there's about 100% chance they've got endometriosis and um, asking those specific questions really helps to build up the picture. Go hunting and ask. Don't just assume that they're going to volunteer the information. Education of our patients and ourselves. We need to advocate for better cheaper medications, fund a, a well-funded primary healthcare service, and then good access to the secondary and tertiary interventions for all patients and also for fertility care. I think we need a national women's health plan as well. And also we need our research to involve Māori and Pacific women more. Thank you. <laughs> so we've had some really very good talks there and I agree with every single word that's been uttered so far this evening. What I'm going to talk about um, is how in primary practice you can look to make an early diagnosis and also how you can look to start treatment early because that is that could be a potential game changer and I, I really think it is. So the first message I want to get across, I'm going to come across with a few very um, simple messages that I want you to take home and you can, I believe, start using them pretty much straight away tomorrow. And <clears throat> try not to use a combined oral contraceptive pill as first line hormone treatment for endometriosis. I'll justify that statement in a moment. So combined oral contraceptive pills are often not effective. Um, there's no regulatory authority in the world has approved combined oral contraceptive pill as treatment for endometriosis. Now this will probably be surprising to you because it's often is the first line that's, that's, that's invoked. And the stinger in the tail is that may make things worse. Message two, try to use a progestin medication as first line hormone treatment for endometriosis. They are effective in controlling symptoms. They are effective in controlling disease progression. And some are registered for use in treating endometriosis by regulatory authorities and the combined pill just isn't. So first of all, I mean, it's pretty obvious we've got, we have to make a diagnosis. And there's been a little bit of talk already about um, how you do that, how you do that early and what is normalized and what, what, what is not in terms of regarding um, pain with, with menstruation. I, I make a very simple distinction. I think women uh, in the amount of pain they have are quite polarized and um, they either have discomfort or they have distress and there are many in the middle. So discomfort, um, painkillers, if they need them, uh, they work, they get on with their day, they get through everything planned to do that day, may take some more, they work, the day is not disrupted. Menstrual distress, the painkillers don't work very well. They're hanging out for the next what, four hours later, they don't work very well. They can't get through what they plan to do for the day. The program has to be cut back or completely hide away with a hottie. That is always abnormal, should be always considered abnormal. This is a um, audit done some years ago now, just looking at women under 20 who presented with mental distress, it was only 4% who turned out not to have endometriosis at laparoscopy. So that's a very strong correlation between the story and what you expect to find. So what do the guidelines say in the world? Well, all of the guidelines um, are out in support of this by coming up with a statement that, that um, Sarah just recently mentioned as well, that many clinicians support the empirical man medical management of endometriosis without needing laparoscopy. And um, many of them go on to say that you shouldn't be delaying instituting treatment on the, on the assumption that endometriosis is likely present when menstrual distress basically is there. You do not need a diagnostic laparoscopy. In the New Zealand guidelines, reflect that and one of the statements in it is laparoscopy should not be used as a diagnostic procedure it's used when treatment is planned so why do we want to diagnose endometriosis early well the only correlation that we have with what we're expecting to find inside any given woman who presents with menstrual distress is not the amount of pain she has it's not necessarily what the ultrasound scan shows it may may be helpful but in, in many cases it doesn't show a lot the only real correlation is age. Under 20, more than 75% of women have grade one or two, grade two disease. 
that means it's confined to the peritoneum. It hasn't started any deep invasion. Only 7% of stage four disease. This is a, an audit that done in, um, in New Zealand. Looking at women who present later, who, who do not get to the point of a laparoscopic diagnosis, say, or a laparoscopic confirmation of what's going on until their 30s, then we have almost half now with some invasive components. Not everyone progresses on in character of disease, but often they do in symptoms. So when you look at what endometriosis at stage one looks like, this is why it doesn't show up on an ultrasound scan. This is just like a paintbrush mark, confined to the peritoneum, which is as thin as glad wrap. Compared to this, which is stage four, and whether you're going to manage this medically or surgically, this is going to be a whole different ball game to manage compared to the stage four disease. What are the tools required then? Well, we need pragmatic guidelines, which I now believe we have. As mentioned before, we need cheap and affordable medical management available to everybody, which means the repertoire of affordable progestins in New Zealand needs to be significantly improved. And others have said this already this evening. Um, yes, in the New Zealand guidelines, we do have um, Dynagest, but it's there to try and force the hand ultimately of government. Um, it, it, it doesn't seem right just to put things down that are available, but we, we have aspiration through these guidelines. And as already mentioned, just because Marina which, and JDS, which is a, a big help now for it to be funded as a pharmaceutical, but it's yet to be funded to be inserted and that, that is still a barrier. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before with message one, do not use combined or contraception first. Um, so most guidelines actually put it number one, but it's become one of those almost medical urban myths that it's something that works and it just keeps getting copied from guideline to guideline, except the New Zealand guideline doesn't do that. The World Endometriosis Society comes closer in that it ranks the combined pill and progestins at an equal footing, um, but nonetheless, it doesn't put the progestins ahead, which it should. So <clears throat> there's only one published randomized placebo controlled trial um, looking at the combined or contraceptive pill and its effectiveness in treating pelvic pain and dysmenorrhea. It showed a 50% reduction in analog scale pain score for menstrual pain, but no effect at all on pelvic pain or dyspareunia. Another non-controlled comparative study showed about 50% of patients with dysmenorrhea had only partial or no improvement in pain. And this is the important thing. There was no predictive value in patients' response to therapy as to whether they were subsequently found to have histologically proven endometriosis. The combined pill is often used as a test for endometriosis with the assumption that if it works, you haven't got endo. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, they are the women I worry about most because you can potentially hide disease until it advances to a greater state. That woman who had stage four disease, the slide, was placed on a combined all contraceptive pill. And for her, it did work um, in that it took all her pain away pretty much. 11 years and so she was about 27 when the pain started to break through the pill. She stopped the pill at 28 to try and conceive all hell broke out and that's what we found. You just don't see 16 year olds with a pelvis like that. That had progressed under cover of all seemingly well. So why is it, are they a problem? And you'll still see articles saying um, that it's a good thing to, to give them but Five micrograms of ethanol estradiol is biologically equivalent to about one milligram of conjugated equine estrogen. Thus, in the 20 to 30 microgram pill, you've got four to six times the physiological dose of estrogen. Added to that, the progesterone receptors in ectopic endometrium are less sensitive than eutopic endometrium. And one of the things that is important in the second half of the cycle is the stimulation of progesterone receptors actually down-regulates the sensitivity of um, 
estrogen receptors in in um, endometrial type tissue. So that compounds the, the the negative effect because in the second half of a normal cycle, estrogen is going down, whereas in, in a combined pill, you 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 having the same dose for at least for 21 days or longer if you're running the packets back to back. So progesterone, if progesterone fails to um, downregulate, um, then it's assumed that downregulate the estrogen receptors, it's, it's, it's thought that it could allow um, retrograde flow of, of your topic endometrium into the peritoneal cavity to into the implants. It's interesting how um, the endometrium recovers after a, a, a period. It used to be thought <laughs> that the basal layer regenerated um, the, the new endometrium, but we now know that 50% of the stem cells that trigger the regrowth of the endometrium after a period actually come from bone marrow. After each after each menses, so you can see how um, a, a problem with endometriotic implants as well can be can be fed and by abnormal hormonal stimulus. While speculative in humans, there is a mouse model to back this up, and that's the difficulty is having hard research on anything. A meta-analysis um, by Verslini has shown that. Um, a, there is a reduced risk of endometriosis in current users, but an increased use in past users. And this is probably means that in suppressing pain in those it does work for, they do not present and are underrepresented, but increased in past. The chaperone in France has shown an increased incidence in past users, and even more worryingly, increased incidence of deep infiltrating disease with an odds ratio of 16.2, which is huge. But wait, there's more. Estrogen is pro-inflammatory. It decreases apoptosis, um, especially in ectopically placed endometrial tissue, whereas progestins have an anti-inflammatory effect and induce apoptosis or cell death, as well as decreasing angiogenesis. They also decrease expression of metalloproteinases and thus ability of utopic or, uh, to invade implants to invade. Message two then regarding progestins. So in contrast to that, there are several randomized placebo controlled trials that show the effectiveness of all progestins such as medroxyprogesterone. You can read them all there. Um, and other non-randomized uh, or randomized studies have, have, have shown this. So Dynagest is probably now the most favored in the developed world. We have not got that in New Zealand, we need it. We need it because it has um, no significant androgenic activity. Um, this you'll see in the New Zealand guidelines is a little bit of an algorithm. This is similar to, to in the guidelines to help guide you down <laughs> choosing a progestin. Um, you will see that some are listed as contraceptives, some aren't. Uh, also in that guideline, there, there is and another table, I think I've got that here, um, highlighted in, in red here, is the dose of progestin that inhibits ovulation. Now, the family of progestins, it can be difficult to find one sometimes that suits any given individual. Um, <clears throat> most of them are plagued by the fact that there are some androgenic side effects, and this can be a problem in the teenage population if they have acne. That's why we need um, Dynagest. That's why I often prescribe cyproton acetate because of the anti-androgenic effect. But there are problems with all of them. It's not. It's harder. It's a harder path to go to find a progestin um, that suits either mood or acne or um, produces a, a complete amenorrhea. Um, it's often just a matter of increasing the dose, but it, but also changing from one to the other. It's very easy to prescribe the old standard, the combined or contraceptive pill. But I do caution you, you may be doing harm and so often it doesn't work. And in Orna's um, patient, it very clearly didn't help. Um, and it was obviously the first line of treatment that was given. 
So some practical points to help you with um, describing. Um, Give a sufficient dose to produce an ovulation. There is plenty evidence uh, that the doses in red on the other slide do produce an ovulation. And, I, and while if someone is very paranoid um, in terms of acting as a contraceptive, you can say, well, you can use condoms as well. Many of my patients elect not to in the end. And I've certainly seen more pregnancies anecdotally using a combined pill than I have using uh, an adequate progesterone dose that produces amenorrhea. Um, some, such as norethisterone, in fact, the only one in New Zealand that, I, that we have that protects bone is norethisterone, so we don't have to worry about osteoporosis with long-term um, ovarian suppression. And it's a good idea to start um, therapy on the first day of, menstrual, of, a, of a menstrual flow. That way you have less chance of breakthrough bleeding as things are settling in. Troublesome bleeding occurs, you could try increasing the progestin dose, you could give five days of estrogen therapy. You can literally flick a coin and try one. You sometimes have to try more than once. Sometimes doxycycline, how does that work? It affects metalloproteinase and metabolism within the, uh, end, the utopic endometrium and um, which often misbehaves in endometriosis. We know that it dysfunctions. Um, and so that concludes my talk. Great, thank you very much, everyone. I think Hannah's just gonna put up a slide um, with some links to further information. Um, and then we'll try and run through a few questions if everyone's ready. So a um, few questions about medication choice. Um, so, uh, what dose of Primalert would be appropriate in treating a patient with suspected endo? And is it taken continuously or cyclically? Yeah, uh, five milligrams has been shown to um, stop ovulation, and it's a fairly reliable um, producer of amenorrhea. If you look at, the, I mean, one of the one of the main problems we have is with the whole list of progestins that we have in the country is only some of them are listed as contraceptives. And this does unnerve clinicians in primary care, um, particularly, as I say, <clears throat> with the teenage and young, uh, and young age group that are yet to um, want to try to conceive. Um, and, but one has to bear in mind that you only get a pearl index for a, for a drug if a drug company wants to market it as a contraceptive. It's an expensive process to go through, and they just don't do it if um, if there if there isn't a, a buck in it really. So you've got the bizarre situation that norethisterone at five milligrams is not listed as a contraceptive, whereas noraday at 0.35 milligrams is. But five milligrams stops ovulation, and 0.35 milligrams doesn't. So five milligrams is a better contraceptive, but it's not listed as one, and you do have to trust the science here. And uh, and actually say, well, that's going to that's going to work. Um, but if can you I, want to I, be medical I'll, legally protecting, then you've got to use condoms. Well, that's what, that's what I was going to say. I mean, I think it would be. I mean, because people often miss pills and forget pills anyway. Um, I think if someone missed their pills and got pregnant, and we had prescribed something that wasn't licensed to be a contraceptive, we'd be on shaky ground in primary care. So. That's you know that's a that's a tricky thing to advocate for. So obviously the ideal is is something which is also licensed. At some point though, we have to stop. We have to think of our patients and stop practicing pre pre preventive medicine in this and um, or protective medicine, shall I say? Preventive, we do need to. We do want them to be contraceptive, contraceptive. But um, so the only the only person you're protecting there is yourself, not not your patient. And I and while that. I know is relevant. There is science behind this. I mean, there are plenty of studies that list, um, in fact, I, the, in the list of references that are cited within the, um, the, the guidelines, there's a whole lot of references in the, in the appendix regarding progestins. There's plenty of evidence in that to back up the case that no, this is a contraceptive. There's no such thing as a fail-safe contraceptive. So failures will occur. But I, I 
for cyproton acetate, I can only think of one woman in my entire career who conceived. I can think of handfuls of women that have conceived on a combined pill, for example. So I think you have to sometimes back it up by saying, well, show me the evidence that I'm wrong. I know we may end up in front of health and disability, but you can present the evidence. Mm -hmm. Um, further questions on uh, on management. Uh, can you give Serazet alongside Noraday um, if you need both of those to control someone's symptoms? And similarly, can you give Serazet to a woman who's already got a Mirena if the Mirena is not adequately well, controlling her symptoms? I'm happy to talk to this. Um, I remember as a junior trainee, you know, you think you know everything, and I was always like, what are these GPs doing, adding combine pills to my renas and this is all hocus pocus but there's bang on what you should do like for my experience the thing with endometriosis and that's to, to tell the patient as well is that it's a um it's a disease that's got progesterone resistant tissues so for them the standard dose of progesterone is not going to be enough um, to manage their bleeding and pain always and a myrena has got a standardized dose and the pills have got standardized doses so essentially we've just got to figure out the dose for them to control their um, endometriosis um, or adenomyosis. So if I've got a myrena in and they're still having cyclical pain or still having bleeding, I just add in more progestogens. <laughs> and which one depends on their side effect profile or it's honestly trial and error. I don't think there's any magic. Um, Serazet, you can add in a cyproterone, um, you can add a Noraday. Um, it's, it's just a matter of keeping your relationship with the patient enough and explaining and educating enough that there's a trial and error process where they feel like we can work through this process together to find the one that's got the best side effect profile for them with the best control for their symptoms, if that makes. Yeah, and I totally agree with that. I mean, um, if you look at what is released systemically from Norida, it's equivalent to about one, sorry, from um, Marina, it's equivalent to about one Norida <clears throat> a week. So adding in a progestin on top of a Marina is actually... Um, I mean, the, the marina is really hardly contributing anything systemically at all. Its effect is primarily locally, and it doesn't stop ovulation, by the way. So adding in an oral progestin to marina, if need be, makes sense. And I'm not anti the combined pill, by the way. Um, I think regimes where you use the combined pill and you top it up with progestin to try and shift the balance, because progesterone resistance is all relative. They still endometriate deposits are still largely responsive to progestin, the studies show it, but it's just diminished res um, receptiveness compared to an, a woman who hasn't got endometriosis in terms of how her utopic endometrium um, reacts. So some women do need a bit of estrogen just to feel balanced and, uh, and then also help combat their acne, but you want to get the ratio right. Uh, how helpful is amitriptyline for endometriosis type pain um, or can it worsen things because of its anticholinergic effect? And um, in my experience, amitriptyline is a very helpful drug. I think it helps um, with a number of things. It, it often helps um, with sleep, which is important. Um, and it helps with uh, bladder, like spasm for muscles. So it helps with pelvic floor. It helps with bladder pain and it helps with IBS. So for me, like I don't, I don't really love pregabalin or gabapentin. Um, I'm, I'm not so familiar with prescribing them. I always feel a bit nervous, and I think that's been borne out by some of the evidence. But I feel like amitriptyline is such a, a good first line kind of drug for those patients who have got multiple symptoms like that going on. Um, and I just start with five milligrams at night, and you can build it up. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, probably a question for Hannah. Um, questions around how much of the endometriosis pain comes from the pelvic floor, like muscle spasm, um, as compared to endo tissue itself? Um, and do you often see vaginismus um, associated with endo? Oh, um, so I think you can only know from assessment. <laughs> so I think it's hearing the story. And I think... Um, especially if it's not cyclical and there's pain it gets worse with exercise if you palpate the muscle and that provokes their pain often it might be sitting alongside their pain so I think you can only really tell by just a thorough subjective assessment to go well what turns your pain on and off mm -hmm. and um and an objective assessment where you actually just assess their pelvic floor muscles um 
often it will get worse with exercise you know they go do a high impact abdominal lots of abdominal core work and they're like that really flared up my pain and you're like okay well we know that um exercise often um you know, reduces prostaglandins and it helps reduce period pain. So if it's making your pain worse, perhaps there's a myofascial component. Mm. And yes, often they do have vaginismus. If they've got tight pelvic floor muscles that then are sore to push on, their automatic reaction is going to be to tighten up mm. to stop something going in. So um, it can be a really mm. common response in these patients. Um, if I can just add to that, if, if that's all right. Um, the pelvic floor tightness is it there's a it's an increased background tone it's not just when approached with either a speculum or for penetration during intercourse um and that uh, you know when it comes down to intercourse i mean they've already tried a bottle of wine and that doesn't work and if you examine these women under general anesthesia um, if they haven't had a muscle relaxant already given, they've still got hypertonus. They're completely asleep. They have no idea that anyone's going anywhere near them, but those muscles are like rods of steel in there, particularly the pubovaginalis muscles are like rods of steel guarding the entritis. And typically those women have pain all the time. It's not just cyclically. So when a woman comes along to you and says that um, it started off cyclically my, with period pain, but now I've got pain all the time, then you know that you've got myofascial issues um, overlaid on top. And it's surprising how quickly that can develop in the, in the clinical course. I guess you're also just considering central sensitization as well, where it might be um, peripheral tissue with um, changes in the central nervous system that might be driving that persistent pain. Uh, questions around kind of doses and duration of things like cyproterone? and the progesterone, how high can you go? Should I talk to the cyproterone? It's something I use a lot. So sure. cyproterone acetate, um, I, it comes in one tablet size, it's 50 milligrams. <clears throat> First thing you've got to tell your patients is that it's only licensed for men with prostate cancer, otherwise I think you've lost the plot completely. But then you have to explain that it is also in Jeanette. Um, in Jeanette, it's only at two milligrams. Um, you don't need, uh, there's one study that shows that maybe even two milligrams will stop um, ovulation, but certainly a quarter of a tablet in many women will, but it doesn't always stop them from bleeding. So um, to a degree, it depends on, on the BMI and overall um, uh, body proportion of the, of the woman in front of me. But so I may start at a 50 milligrams, someone who's very slight build, I might go down to 25 milligrams and then even try and get it further down. I often add a little bit of add back estrogen, in, but now we have to counsel them that there was a paper published in the BMJ this year that shows that high dose cyproterone acetate does increase the chance of benign intracranial meningiomas. Now they're a very rare um, disorder, but and three times rare is still rare, but um, I worked out that about 400, I need 400 women on cyproterone high dose cyproterone for 10 years to get one extra case in the community. So it's- What high dose, worse. sorry, Mike? What do you consider high dose? Uh, I think anything above the, um, a quarter of a tablet, 25.5 milligrams upwards, mm -hmm. according to the paper. Um, and Sarah, that. would you be, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mike. Uh, Sarah, would you be okay to talk about how, how high and for how long can you go with uh, progesterone? I think the first thing is you've got to figure out how much you need for symptom control. <laughs> um, that's basically what I aim for. So I think, I don't know. I, we, don't, we don't get to, I mean, we've got so many patients at Middlemore for their abnormal bleeding and their um, pre-cancers that we're treating with like 100 milligrams of Provera a day. So to me, like, I don't, we never have to get anywhere near the high for endometriosis. Um, and obviously it's mainly side effects driven. Um, this is like smarties just give it till the bleeding and the pain stop <laughs> um, <laughs> obviously as long as you're addressing everything else as well you know but if the uterus and the lesion are causing pain and you've addressed them in other ways and like i've got patients you know you've done surgery it's the uterus that's causing the problem and you need to get it to stop bleeding um and sometimes you do need estrogen as well because sometimes they get that kind of bleeding you get when you get a very thin endometrium so you, you know you've got a it's a lot of trial and error but i'm not scared to go high I, I, I understand that. I, I often add 
in a, a milligram of Proganova. Yeah. Um, in practice, I don't go higher than 50 milligrams very often. No. Um, uh, only not because I'm frightened to prescribe it. A colleague, an uh, endocrinological colleague in my in Christchurch, does um, quite often go up to 100 milligrams. But but for what I'm prescribing for, um, I find it doesn't tend to help with yeah. bleeding control beyond 50. Doubling it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. It does with other preparations. Uh, you know, you can increase the dose and get. But beyond 50 milligrams, cyprotron doesn't seem to have any advantage. No. Oh, yeah. And Provera, I think we're talking about as well. I think that's probably the same. For endometriosis, I've never prescribed that much for endo. It's mainly in women with, you know, very obese women who've got pre-cancer that we're trying to not operate on. So can I uh, can I ask a question? Just um, <clears throat> just thinking along the lines of the sort of um, access to you know to to treatment. Mm. Um, I mean, am I right in thinking that, uh, you know, it, in the DHB where, where we both work, mm. it, it, only P1 and P2 yeah. priorities are oh, being yeah. seen at the moment? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Oh, no, 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 we're seeing P3 abnormal uterine bleeding because they might have cancer because we've got such a high rate of endometrial cancer yeah. in our population. So yeah. we definitely see the, um, but now those ones need a scan and a papel, I think is the latest guideline. So yeah. those are the back doors for me. Like the back doors, we're still despite there being a two years with no P3s with pelvic pain being seen, we're still doing surgery. And the back doors are really admission to gynae. Um, somehow if you get past the ED and actually onto the ward, often you'll get a sack pack filled in for surgery um, through the chronic pain team. And also through, um, if they get referred for something else, um, usually abnormal bleeding. Um, and then we sort of realize that they've got endometriosis. Those are the real reasons why we're still operating on patients. And we've still got a wait list of at least 50 patients waiting. Just to, these are not the ones that are able to be outsourced. These are just ones, and not the ones with severe endo, just um, of peritoneal diseases, at least 50 patients still waiting for surgery um, for that kind of endometriosis as well. So, And uh, how, how long would they have to wait before they... Um, if you don't meet the criteria for our outsourcing, so that's managed to with your comorbidities and BMI, um, then you might be waiting up to 12 months. Okay. It's a failure of duty of care, isn't it? That we have? Completely. It's so awful. It's really, you know, you know, we feel like, I felt like a physiological response to Orna's story, and I feel like this way whenever I go to clinic, or you just feel so sad for these women, and, and, and all the patients out there who aren't even being seen, and for the poor GPs who are having to manage them, you know, with no resources, it's just... It was a beautifully presented story, and, and, and um, I can imagine that all of the general practitioners, primary care physicians watching mm -hmm. would have several stories that match yeah. it. Well, I, I mean, I think, I think it presents, uh, you know, a, a moral injury, which yeah. obviously people talk about that a lot now, but you know, the patients are suffering mm. and the, you know, the specialists who are trained can't do what they're trained to do. Mm. Um, we aren't funded to do what we would like to do. Mm. Um, it is a failure of the system and it, it is very difficult to see how this can improve. I mean, do, do any of you feel that with the upcoming changes to the system that things might look any different? Or I, no, I, I agree with Sarah. Um, that a lot of the of the of the structure around care needs to be taken out into the community. And but it's properly funded, you know, as well. Like, yeah. you know, obviously, therapy yeah. and yeah. adequate pain management is a is is a no brainer. Um, uh, but um, yeah, it, it, it's so hard to to access things. I think, can I just jump in here? Because yeah. it may give some hope. Thank you all so much for attending tonight's uh, Goodfellow um, webinar and also to the presenters. We've been uh, working on this for some time. So thank you immensely from me and from Endometriosis New Zealand. Look, some of you might want to go to those resources. It's not just a link, but on the NZ Endo page, we have many advisors who actually write responses to patient questions. And there's a, a lot of, um, it's used a lot. Uh, there are other resources there and little videos on exercise, nutrition, um, what to do. And I think it gives um, a, a really good 
uh, home base for New Zealanders as a referral, um, an incredible, uh, believable and plausible, um, medic medically responsible way for you to refer your, your patients to there. And I think, you know, with the work that I've done with uh, education in schools and the um, publication in the Antidog Journal, we know that 27% of our youngsters miss school every or most months with severe dysmenorrhea. And looking at my slides, knowing how many of them may have endometriosis, it's actually crucial that we work really hard with our ministry and, and with you to make your job easier at primary care. So thanks for attending tonight. Thanks, Deborah. We have gone over time a little bit, but if our panelists are okay, I just wanted to sneak in one more question. It's probably not a very easy one, but if you can summarize, what would be your advice to say GPs or patients who have endometriosis but are wanting to conceive? And just to try. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have a terrible thing to say. I mean, I think that obviously we have to worry about, you know, first of all, you don't know about your fertility potential unless you try to get pregnant. You know, I think um, I've got patients who they present for the first time. I get quite a few of these women in their 40s, um, Pacific Island women, They've got severe endometriosis, frozen pelvis. The only reason we know about it is because they have a cyst and they've had six children and no period pain. So I think, you know, the first thing is we don't know you have a fertility problem until you have a fertility problem. Um, but obviously being aware that there can be an issue. So, you, you know, if you're not getting pregnant within six months, then that's a good time to seek um, some further advice. Um, and in the meantime, obviously you can't be on hormones when you're trying to conceive. So we need to consider... Um, timely non at the as soon as the onset of the period or even just prior if you can, and then tranexamic acid, those things are safe in pregnancy. And then all the other things, pelvic floor physio, you know, um, bowel management, bladder management, these things as well. Anyway. So just to add into that though, uh, there is one hormonal treatment that you can do, and I, I've been surprised how effective it can be, and that is using uterogestin from day 14 through to day about 26 to 27. So that will not, um, act as a contraceptive. Um, it will act as endometrial support. I mean, it, we use it, uh, it's used in IVF clinics to help support the um, to implantation after transfer of an embryo. So, mm. and and I, and when I first started just experimenting with that, um, I honestly didn't think it would work very well, just 100 milligrams daily. It's not funded, but it is only for 14 days, which works out to about um, $15, $16 per cycle. Um, but but it had a, a greater effect than I um, than I was expecting, and I've used it quite successfully now with women that are needing help yet trying to conceive. Great, thank you. It, it, it is also unfunded. That that's you know another problem. I know. It's oh, yeah. that's so popular. Should find for... introduction as well. <laughs> I'll add it to my list. <laughs> yeah, because obviously you know really popular for MHT, but you yeah, know yeah. another another cost. And certainly. the side effects are often far more tolerated, aren't they? So. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. Uh, sorry for going over time. We just had a lot of very good questions coming in. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us tonight. A big thank you to our panel for joining us tonight. Um, and I hope everyone has a very lovely night. Thank you.